Good evening. Good evening. Oh, man. So there goes Lon getting his bag. It's all good, Lon. You should have left it in here, huh? All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate your participation in the 2017 Iowa Federation of Labor Hall of Fame. We're very fortunate this evening to have a uh, keynote speaker, and you know everybody says, "Oh, somebody that doesn't need any introduction." I really got the luck of the draw here because I do have that person here. If you're a Democrat, if you're a labor person in this state, our next speaker, our keynote speaker for the evening, truly needs no introduction. He's been a friend of labor and a friend of Iowans and a friend of everybody who works in this country for more years than I can even begin to say. It's my distinct pleasure and great honor to introduce to you Senator Tom Harkin. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah, God. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I, you better be damn careful I may run again if you keep that kind of applause. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that was really great. Thank you very much. And Kenny Sager, Kenny, thank you very much, President Sager. Kenny said, thank you for being here tonight. I said, thank me. I thank you for an old has-been like me to be invited back with all my friends. Thank you for having me back here again. I appreciate it. So Kenny and Holly and Charlie Wishman, Kate, all my friends who are here are inductees tonight. Bruce Clark, APWU. That was that was uh, Bruce. And I met a couple, three people here tonight that worked with my brother Frank, who was an APWU member here in Des Moines. <laughs> Actually, my brother belonged to two unions in his lifetime. One was UAW. UAW here. Hey, by the way, welcome UAW to the AFL-CIO Hall here in Iowa. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny Sager. I still have a file at home. I haven't given it to the Institute yet on uh, what happened at Delavan's. Now, you younger people don't know what I'm talking about. But what happened at Delavan's, my brother was a UAW member out there, and you people have been around for a couple of years remember how they busted the union out there. I'll never forget what my brother told me that one time. You know, I'm digressing here a little bit. This is not part of my notes, but I'm digressing here a little bit because it got me thinking about it. Uh, my brother belonged to that union for 22 years. All that time, they never had one labor problem. <clears throat> No strikes, no work stoppages, collective bargaining, everything worked out fine. And then old man Delavan, I say that fondly because I got to meet him later on, sold the company to a bunch of young investors. And I have in my file that Des Moines Register page in which one of these young investors, they'd put money together and bought it, bragged, if you want to see how to get rid of a union, come to Delavan's. Openly bragged about it. And I remember when they went on strike, and my brother walking the picket lines there and all the strife. And I, was in, I had just been elected to Congress. And I remember so many of the South Central labor body that helped on that. But they brought in the striker replacements. They busted the union. My brother said, you know, he said, out in back of Delavan's was a trash heap. It was a, 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 a pile of uh, shavings, metal shavings, because they made jet engine nozzles and stuff. And uh, my brother said, I feel like that trash heap. They used me up, they wore me out, and they just threw me out on the trash heap of life. I'll never forget that. 
And I said, if I could ever do anything about that, I would. And I'm going to have more to say about that in a second. But I'll tell you, what happened at Delavan's and how they bring in stacker replacements, it ought to be against the law to bring in replacements for legitimate strikers. <laughs> and Jerry Kearns, my gosh, Jerry, I ran for the Senate in 84, went down to Lee County, and there was this supervisor down there, told me not to worry, he'd take care of it for me. And boy, did he ever. Uh, we came out of there with a huge margin of victory Never lost Lee County, never did. And Jerry was always there for me, and I think a couple of times our elections uh, intersected where he was running and I was running at the same time. And I always liked those times when he was on the ballot and I was on the ballot, because I knew he was gonna get the vote out in Lee County <laughs> for Jerry Kearns, and he would do it. And so that was all those years. And then later when Jerry got elected to the legislature, you got to remember that, 2008. And now he's a seasoned legislator. And after the next election, he'll be in the majority in the Iowa legislature, too. <laughs> Jerry. And Fred Noon, I, I, I'm sorry that Fred's not here. And I don't know all of his family, but there a lot of the Noon family are here, right? A lot of his family and friends I know are here. And... Uh, Fred, a proud veteran, we always talked about that, Labor's Local, 353, longtime member of the Central, South Central Fed, uh, Federation of Labor. Um, anyway, uh, an avid hunter, passed away too soon. I told someone earlier, I said, I had a story about Fred, and I thought maybe I should tell it. What the heck, I'm going to tell it anyway. So, so... Fred was a great supporter of mine and, and, and uh, uh, in the building trades. And so, <laughs> uh, one time, oh, it was 1984. 1984, I'm running for the Senate. I had an ad. I had an ad that had run on the radio. It was a radio ad, and it was about me hunting, hunting pheasants. That was a pretty good ad. And we ran it the day before pheasant season opened, say. And we ran it like at 5 a.m. in the morning, 6 a.m. when all the hunters are out there in the pickups just waiting for the sun to come up. 8 o'clock, go out hunting. And uh, it was pr pretty good. And at the end of it, I said, you know, I'm proud. I'm a gun owner. I've been a gun owner all my life. I'm a proud hunter. I've hunted all my life. And I said, and I'll bet that Roger Jepson doesn't even own a gun. Now, Roger Jepson was the Republican senator I was running against, right? I just said that. I didn't know. I just said it. I said, I'll bet he doesn't even own a gun. Well, Roger Jepson called a press conference <laughs> to say that Harkin wasn't telling the truth, that he was indeed a gun owner and a proud gun owner. One of the reporters here asked the question, uh, Senator Jepson, what make and model of gun do you own? <laughs> he couldn't answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> I, not every time I saw Fred, but damn near every time I saw him, he reminded me of that and laughed and laughed that great laugh of his about Jepson not even knowing what kind of gun he owned, because he probably obviously didn't, didn't even own one. Anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's my story about, about Fred, about Fred Noon, great guy. Well, all of our great honorees tonight, again, thanks for having me back. Thank all of you for all your support for my 30 years in the Senate, my 10 in the House. A lot of people ask me if I miss the Senate. I say, not really, not really. I miss a lot of my friends. People I just, people like you, I used to see a lot, and I don't see them as much anymore. But I'm enjoying retirement with my grandkids. I just said to Kenny, I said, you know, one of the reasons I'm a little late, I've been down three days at, at Honey Creek, which is down on Lake Raspin with my grandkids. It was a great time, great time. But I must confess, 
that even though I'm enjoying my retirement, you know, I'm half Slovenian and half Irish. That's a bad combination. <laughs> we, we get pretty excitable at times, and the blood can boil, and I gotta tell you, my Irish and Slovenian blood, a lot of times, wants me to be back in the Senate to punch his lights out on a daily basis and stop Trump's assault on America. Well, my message tonight is simple. For the last 40 years, our country has let organized labor down, and that has hurt our country. And I want to be forthright. My party has been complicit in that. My party has been complicit in that three times. Once, three times since I've been there. Once in 1978, I was a House member, and there was a bill called Labor Law Reform. Great bill, we got it through the House, Tip O'Neill was Speaker. Went to the Senate, got killed in the Senate. President Carter never lifted a finger to even help or to do what was necessary to get the votes. 1994, this is personal, the anti-striker replacement bill. I just told you what happened to my brother. So this came before the Senate committee. I was a member of it. Ted Kennedy was the chair. We got it through the committee. Oh, it passed the House. Dick Gephardt, Speaker of the House, got the bill through the House. We had enough votes in the Senate. We had enough votes in the Senate, and we had a Democratic president by the name of Bill Clinton. So we got it through the committee, brought it on the House, I brought it on the Senate floor, and of course it was a filibuster by the Republicans. We needed 60 votes to break the filibuster. We were short a couple, three votes. And again, President Clinton didn't do what he needed to do. And Metzenbaum, a guy by the name of Howard Metzenbaum, Senator Metzenbaum and I led the effort on the Senate floor on that. We lost two senators, two Democratic senators from the state of Arkansas. Lyndon Johnson would never have let that happen, I can tell you that. They'd been from Texas. Well, that was quite a loss. The last one was 2010. Now I'm chairman. Ted Kennedy has passed away. Now I'm chairman of the largest committee in the Senate, the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. In 2009, early, I remember it was Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. We had a meeting down at the AFL-CIO headquarters because they wanted to get something called EFCA, the Employee Free Choice Act, through. And Ted Kennedy announced at this meeting, we had all the labor people there, Kennedy, me, others there, and um, Kennedy said, look, and he'd already talked to me about it, and he said, look, I, I'm sick, I can't handle this, I've gotta fight this brain cancer I have, he said, I'd like you to back Harkin on this. Let, let Harkin take the ball. I said, fine, I love it. So I got to carry the EFCA ball. Again, Nancy Pelosi got it passed in the House, comes to the Senate, my committee now. Get it out of committee, I have no problem with that. I want to get it on the floor. I worked for a year, well, maybe over a year, to get the votes rounded up, just to break the filibuster. I had enough votes to pass the bill. I needed 60 votes to break the filibuster. We had 60 Democrats in the Senate. But there was something called the Affordable Care Act. It was up at the same time. So what was I promised? We can't, the President Obama said, no, we can't do that. We gotta do the Affordable Care Act first, then we'll get to that. This was in October of 2010. Well, we got we got the uh, Affordable Care Act passed, but a strange thing happened. Ted Kennedy had passed away. They put a Democrat in, the governor did, in Massachusetts. Huh? What was his name? No, 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 not Scott Brown. No, the Democrat who was put in, or I, I just lost his name, former chair of the, of the National Democratic Party. But then there was a special election in January 
and he lost and Scott Brown won, and there went my 60th vote. If we'd have had it up in October, we could have passed the darn thing. And again, I just didn't think the president and others put their full weight behind it. Well, anyway, those were three times I think about what we should have really, we should have done a lot more and uh, worked a lot harder on those. But the one bright spot I say to all my friends in the building trades is Davis Bacon is still going strong. And we still have a good Davis Bacon bill. Although under Reagan, as you know, they, they raised the 30% to 50%. I'm not gonna get into the weeds on you that. But what they basically did is they made everything the prevailing wage rather than what it ought to be. But we still have good Davis Bacon. But as I understand it, they're after that too. They're after that too. Now my message here is not to put blame on Democrats. It's not to put my party in the same basket as Trump's party. Because without strong democratic leadership for the last 50 years, there would be no unions today. We'd be like China. We'd be like China, with no unions. And I might say here in Iowa, without strong democratic leadership, like Mike Gronstall and Jerry Kearns and others, I'm sure in this room. If we didn't do that, I'll tell you, the right to work law in this state would even be more onerous than it is. If we'd had democratic control of the legislature, they never would have passed that bill that they did this year. That Kenny was telling me about, uh, about what they've done on, on collective bargaining for state, county, municipal employees. So I'm not saying that we're in the same basket. I'm just saying that we gotta redouble our efforts in the future. We can't keep going down this, rate, this road. In state after state, Republican governors and legislators are enacting stronger right to work laws, doing away with union shop. And again, my message is not to discourage you or to imply that all is lost and that we're finished. My message is that sitting back and waiting for something better to happen is not the answer, either to Trump or to the Koch brothers and their anti-union crusade of their right-wing cabal. Sitting back won't do it. We need to be vocal and proud of what unions have done and what they do for America. And we gotta keep reminding people that the law is on our side. And I wrote this down before I came here. A lot of people don't know this. When I was chair of the Labor Committee, and ah, maybe even before, especially when I was chair, my Republican friends would always accuse me of siding with labor. You know, you're supposed to be impartial, Mr. Chairman. You're siding with labor. I said, no, I'm just following the law. You've got to read the National Labor Relations Act, 1935, it's Title 29 of the U.S. Code. It's in the law. And here's what it says. It is declared to be the policy of the United States to eliminate the causes of certain substantial obstructions to the free flow of commerce and to mitigate and eliminate these obstructions when they have occurred by encouraging the practice and procedure of collective bargaining and by protecting the exercise by workers of full freedom of association, self-organization, and designation of representatives of their own choosing for the purposes of negotiating the terms and conditions of their employment or other mutual aid or protection. So, and they accuse me of being, I just read it, and I said, I'm just following the law. You, the ones who are trying to bust unions and stuff, you're the ones that are outside the law. You're the ones that are breaking America down. This is what built America up and made us the envy of the world. So again, I just say, So EFCA, 
I said a lot during F. I said, you know, freedom of association, self-organization. I was just trying to fulfill the law's mandate. The law's mandate. So in closing, I'd just say this. We need a new burst of organizing. Organizing people we've never organized before. Computer programmers, data entry people, fast food workers, domestic workers, every construction worker in America, nursing home workers, every state municipal employee, every teacher, every renewable energy worker, and so many others in our society that needs to be organized. We need fewer members of the billionaire class and more members of the union club in America. In America today, too few people have too much money and too much power. And too many people have too little of either one. Like my friend Jim Hightower used to always say, money's like manure. Those of you who know what farming's like. You know, if you take a pile of manure and you pile it all up in one spot, it kills everything beneath it. But if you take that same manure and spread it around, things grow. Money's like manure, spread it around. And the best way to break down that manure pile and spread it around is more union members in America. <laughs> we need a new commitment to Title 29. And the three we honor tonight gave their all to advance the mandate of the National Labor Relations Act. If young people just entering unions are as energized and motivated and hardworking as Clark and Kearns and Noon, then organized labor will have a resurgence in Iowa and America. And that, Donald Trump, is truly what will make America great again. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I went on a bit long. No, no, no. Thank you all. You sure you don't want to come on a retirement? <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> oh, was that a motion? Was that, okay. Yes, indeed. Um,